Good morning. What a joy it is to welcome everyone in a morning like this. And we've had such a succession of beautiful days. It's been glorious, hasn't it? And it's lovely to see the light in the church coming in. Uh, we have a different team in charge of things this morning. It's my joy to welcome the Reverend Alan Reid, our moderator in the vacancy, to lead us in worship. And David Cairns has been good enough to play in Rosemary's absence. So we will enjoy this time together, I'm sure. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Lovely to be here, as ever, and as Pat says, um, beautiful on a day like this. And all the better for seeing your sunny faces as well. <laughs> <Ka>. <laughs> Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. God's love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. God's love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. God's love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven. God's love endures forever. Let us worship God together. We sing in our first hymn, Sing of the Lord's Goodness. Thank you. Eternity. 
and yet you are here. We bow low in your presence and we humble ourselves before you. For you are our creator and our provider. You are our sustainer and you are the Holy One. We confess to you, Lord God, that we are very far from what we should be. We are not holy. We have grieved you and caused pain to one another. We have fallen short of what you have called us to be and we are truly sorry. Lord, as we quiet ourselves before your living presence, we know that we are deserving of your anger and yet, Lord, you come to us in love and mercy. And as we confess our sins to you, we rejoice to hear again the word of salvation and hope. Go and sin no more. Your sins have been forgiven. Lord, we thank you that you meet with us as we gather here. We thank you that as we open ourselves to you, you will come and speak with us and minister to us. And so, Lord, we open ourselves now. Come, Holy Spirit, and move among us in these moments that we share. Help us to fix our eyes upon Jesus, that as we break bread together and share a cup of wine, we may enter into Christ's death and resurrection and know again that we are loved and that we are called to be your family in this place. Unite our hearts in worship and send us from this place renewed in faith to the work of your kingdom to which you call us. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If I was to ask you what your treasure was, what was your what is your greatest treasure? What would you say? Is there a thing or a or a person or what would be your greatest treasure in life? What do you value most of all? Not just the children, adults can answer too. <laughs> Anything? Would it be family? Yes. Family would be up there. Would it be your bank balance? <laughs> would it be a pet? Or maybe a special piece of jewellery or a special possession? We've all, got, we've all got different things. Maybe it wouldn't be something that you can feel or touch. Maybe it would be something like education or music. I wonder what is your greatest treasure? When I think about treasure, I immediately think about pirates. <laughs> and so I'd like you to imagine a treasure chest. I guess all of our treasure chests will be slightly different, but mine's, mine's made of wood and it's got metal and it's got a big padlock on it. And what do pirates do with their treasure? They hide it, don't they? They hide it. They hide it away. And, and how do they remember where they've put the treasure? Oh, let's have another answer, yeah? A treasure map. A treasure map, yeah. Have you ever seen a treasure map? What does a treasure map look like? Does it have, does it have names and places on it or anything? What does it have on it? It's got a cross in the middle. X marks the spot, isn't it? 
But it's got to be, it's got to be a wee bit secret, doesn't it? Because if, if it just said, you know, that the cross is right beside Orwell Church, then you wouldn't, everybody could find the treasure. It wouldn't be hard to find. So sometimes they don't put names on it. They just put little pictures. And they know, they know where the treasure is. And once they've got to the place where it is, they can see where the X is. And there is the treasure. Well, Jesus once told a story. It's one of the shortest stories in the whole Bible. It's only one sentence. But it was a story that Jesus told about that kind of thing. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. And maybe there was a map of the field with an X where the treasure was. I don't know. He doesn't say that. But he says, it's like a treasure hidden in a field which someone found and then hid again. In their joy, they went and sold all that they had and bought that field. Why did they buy the field? So that they could go and get the treasure. Yeah, because it was <coughs> hidden there. They would found it and it didn't belong to them. So they thought, well, I'll hide it and then nobody will know there's treasure there and I'll make a wee map with X marks the spot. And then I'll go and make sure I buy the field and then the treasure will belong to me. So he sold everything that he had so that he could buy that one field. But actually... When he was talking here, Jesus wasn't really thinking about buried treasure like pirates once hid. He was talking about the treasure that it is to know God. That's the greatest treasure in the whole world. Family, great. Jewelry, great. Bank balance, great. Music, all these things that we think of as our treasures, they're all good things. But greater than all of them is knowing God. Knowing God is the greatest treasure. It's the most valuable thing in the world. And you would have thought that there was no, no treasure map with X marking the spot. But actually there is. I've got it here. This is the treasure map. The Bible. The Bible is the map that shows us where to find this treasure, how to find God. This is our treasure map. And there's also an X that marks the spot. In fact, you said it was a cross, didn't you? In the field. Well, there's another cross that is where God has marked where the treasure is to be found. The treasure is to be found in Jesus. Jesus and his death for us. And that's what we're celebrating here today. You don't think about celebrating a death, do you? But we're celebrating the fact that Jesus died, his body was broken and his blood was shed for us, and he rose again from the dead to show us where the treasure is, to find God for ourselves. When we gather at the Lord's table, we leave everything else behind and we just come to God. We come to the cross to know God better. We ask the Holy Spirit to help us today to know God, the greatest treasure that is in the whole of the world. Let's pray together. Lord our God, we rejoice before you because you have shown yourself to us. You've made yourself known to us in Jesus, your son, and we thank you. We're full of praise and gratitude for all that you've done for us. And most of all, for giving up your life so that we could have life in its fullness. Help us, Lord, to read your word, to follow the directions and to find that treasure for ourselves, that we might leave everything else behind and find life in Christ. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing again.
Lord, to the light of your light, love is shining. from Matthew chapter 9, verses, verse 35. Jesus went through all the town and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. And from verse 10, chapter 10, verse um, 8. Well, no, no, read, read through from there. Oh, you want me to read right through? All right, yes, that's fine. Didn't get that, the message right there. Just then. two verses. Yeah, right, <laughs> I did think it was rather short. Um, <laughs> when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plent plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. 
He called his twelve disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. The first, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and third Thaddeus, Simon and Zelot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town in the, of, the Samarit, of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel, as you, are, as you so preach this message, the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, and cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons, freely you have, you have received, freely give. Thanks, Jean. Thank you, Jean. And may God bless to us the reading of his word. Let's sing again. The Lord is King. Lift up your voice. <laughs> Send your light forth and your truth, and let them be our guides, and lead us to your holy hill, that we may see you more clearly, and that we may love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly, day by day. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. 
So far in his gospel, Matthew has recounted the story of Jesus' own ministry, his threefold ministry of teaching in the synagogues, of preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and of healing every kind of disease and sickness. Jesus' experience had been of crowds flocking, responding in faith to his preaching, committing themselves to following him in the way of the kingdom, queuing up eagerly for his healing and transforming touch. But as he sees the, the crowds in their vastness, his heart is filled with pity for them. And he knows that ministering to their earthly needs is too much for him to accomplish on his own. The vision has to be shared with the 12. He cannot do it by himself, and he gathers the 12 around them and appoints them as apostles, those who are sent. And they too have to be shepherds of the flock. They too have to be involved in harvesting. And the baton that Jesus is here passing to his first disciples is the baton that is now in our hands to shepherd the flock, to harvest the crop, to proclaim the kingdom. The challenge, he says, is to take the proclamation of the kingdom to all the world, beginning where we are and not resting until all peoples everywhere have come to know the Lord, this great treasure. And what I'd like to explore with you this morning is how we cooperate with Christ in our time in the fulfillment of this mission, once entrusted to the apostles, now in our hands. First of all, we're challenged about what motivates us. What motivates us for this mission that we've been given? Matthew tells us that Jesus' heart was filled with pity, with compassion for the crowds. And he uses a really extraordinary word. It's almost unpronounceable in, in the Greek. Most Greek is unpronounceable, but this is even more unpronounceable. It's, the word is esplanthnisthe. Esplanthnisthe. You kind of trip over your tongue even just trying to get the letters out. And in English, it literally means that he was moved in the guts it's a really visceral sort of word. I think um, it's maybe the authorized version uses the, the phrase, his entrails heaved, or maybe that's Shakespeare, I can't remember. <laughs> but that's the kind of picture that he's, he's giving by this word. And, and actually, although it's not a particularly nice, you know, your, your, your guts heaving or your entrails, it's not a very nice thought, but we know what it means, don't we? We know what it means to have that feeling in your tummy. Now, it may be because you've fallen in love, or it may be that you're nervous about something, but your, your heart flutters, your stomach churns. That's what Jesus felt. That's what he felt when he looked out on all these people. He calls them sheep without a shepherd. And, and it breaks his heart. He yearns for them deep within, and he still yearns in the same way now at the Father's right hand. One commentator writing about this passage wrote this, and, and I found these words really challenging. He says, alas, the church is very unlike Jesus. We do not care. We do not go out in mission. Maybe we're too empty. Maybe we're too respectable. Maybe we're too similar to those who do not profess to know Christ that it would be embarrassing to approach them. We are too apathetic. We do not share the compassion of Jesus. Perhaps we do not even look, let alone care. Hard words, indeed, and yet, there's a modicum of truth in there, I think. Maybe that's why we're slow to act. We're not 
motivated. Our stomachs are not churning with pity for the world around us. I was thinking back uh, the other day to, to one summer when we were on holiday as a family on a caravan site when the boys were just we. It's years and years ago now. And I remember going out late on the Saturday night, taking the dog for a, his last walk before we, w we settled down for the night. And, and I was wondering to myself what, what the church would be like that we would go to the following morning. We hadn't been before. We were just going to turn up at the door, hopefully at the right time and not too late with two young kids in tow. You can imagine the scene. And I was wondering about what, what it would be like, whether it would be a, a good experience for us all. And as I walked, I came to the, the building that was the kind of focal point of the campsite where the, the, register, the reception was and the restaurant, bars and all, all kinds of things there. And as I approached it, I could almost see the, the thing heave, heaving with people, the, the beat of the music, bum, 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 from inside. And people pouring money into gaming machines in through the windows people coming and going, dressed to kill, made up to the nines, many of them, sadly, the worse for drink. And I remember feeling my stomach heave then. And I remember thinking, this is where Jesus would be. This is where Jesus would be, not in church tomorrow morning. He would be here. Did I do anything about it? went back to the caravan with the dog, went to bed. We all went to church the next morning while many probably on the site were sleeping off the night before. How unlike Jesus I was, I am. Do our stomachs turn over with compassion for the world around us? For our community, for many who are without hope, without God in the world, as Paul describes it. Do we pray for them? Do we reach out to them? Jesus still yearns for the sheep who are without a shepherd today, but do we? Are we motivated for mission? And if I'm honest with myself, probably not. But Jesus also challenges us about the nature of the mission. For the second time in his gospel, Matthew very, very obviously describes Jesus' ministry in threefold terms. He speaks about him teaching, preaching, and healing. And since we are carrying the same baton as he handed on to his first disciples, he told them in our reading today, this is what you must do. Preach the kingdom. Heal the sick. Teach the good news. If we are carrying that same baton, then our mission should surely be characterized by the same kind of things. And yet most of us tend to have a narrow view of what mission is. And we all think we have it right. For some, it's about getting new folk into the church, whether they've come from unbelief to faith or whether you've just pinched them from someone else's church. It's about mission. It's our mission. It's about building the congregation. Some of us consider mission to be about persuading others to accept the claims of Christ, whether or not they ever go on to have any engagement with the church. And others consider the church's mission to be primarily a social one, ministering to people's physical or emotional needs, whether or not there's any overt sharing of the good news about Jesus. But I think what Matthew is saying here is that none of these things on their own is an adequate de definition of Christian mission. We need to work at being much closer to the three-dimensional pattern that Jesus gave, teaching the whole counsel of God revealed in the scriptures, preaching the good news of saving grace, and bringing wholeness and healing to those who are sick in body or mind or spirit. We need to be 
touching people's lives in physical and emotional ways. We need to be calling people to conversion and a new dimension of life. And we need to be building up people in the faith. All of these things, three dimensions, are the nature of our mission today. That's what Jesus yearns for us to do today. But where do we start? What is the foundation of our mission? Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. They're very famous words. I wonder how do you hear that verse? It's often heard as a call to action, a call for workers to get up off their beam ends and get out and do the work of the kingdom. And I will almost certainly have preached a sermon on that basis before. The harvest needs workers. Come on, folks, who's going to go? You've heard the sermon, haven't you? Come on, get up there, get out there, get on with the job. And that's a biblical message. There's a time and a place to proclaim it. It's just not the message of this verse. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few, says Jesus. And then he says, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. He doesn't say, ask the congregation in front of you to go. He says, talk to God about it. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers. If we're going to share in the mission of Christ, we have to start in the place of prayer. And that's something that every single one of us here can easily do. Here on Wednesday night, we had a gathering of elders from across the, the whole parish grouping to talk about our mission going forward. And it was only after that that I came to this passage. But I, we, were, we were thinking very much about listening at the conference, listening to our community and listening to God. And it kind of chimed with me that that is where we need to start. We need to start in prayer, not just talking to God, but listening for God as well. And that's the foundation of our mission. So you'd be glad to know I'm not giving the altar call here today to say, who's going to get up and go out today in mission? It may be you, but it's for God to prompt you, not me to ask you today. To pray is simply to turn our thoughts to Jesus and share what is on our mind and on our heart with him. It may be a longing. It may be a sense of gratitude. It may be a complaint or a question or an expression of fear or anxiety. It may be a very specific request that we bring. Most of the time we keep these thoughts to ourselves. Maybe we share them with a friend or a family member. How often do we consciously share them with God? We sang a moment ago, Come, make your wants your burdens known. Christ will present them at the throne. It's a beautiful picture, that. The ascended Christ is receiving our prayers and whispering them in the Father's ear. He is at the Father's side, the man of love, the crucified. The importance of prayer in the life of the Christian cannot be overemphasized. And yet, the majority of us, I include myself, don't ever get near to scratching the surface of what is possible through prayer. What is certainly the case for most congregations is that prayer falls very far down the agenda. And beyond our brief times of prayer in the course of Sunday worship, most of us hardly ever join together with others to pray, far less pray as if our lives depended on it. The harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. We know that too well. 
What are we going to do about it? Ask the Lord of the harvest. We're called to share in the mission of Christ. And quite naturally, that feels like a task that is beyond us. But God doesn't expect us to accomplish it on our own, in our own feeble strength. He calls us to turn to him in prayer, to cry out to him in acknowledgement of our need. And what I know from experience will happen is that we'll find our motivation heightened as a result. We'll find our compassion deepened as a result. We'll find the nature of our task becoming clear to us as a result of our praying and what previously seemed impossible becoming possible. And we'll find that when we put our trust in God, the foundation proves to be solid. So let me challenge you this morning to pray. Very consciously to pray this week. Just speak to God about the world around you and about what he wants you to be doing there. You don't need to use special words or holy language. Just tell Jesus what's on your heart. The same way you might tell a close friend. And he will take your prayers and lay them before the Father in glory. Father, I place into your hands the things that I can't do. Father, I place into your hands the times that I've been through. Father, I place into your hands the way that I should go. For I know I always can trust you. And if we're serious as we pray, we'll be astonished at the things that will have changed when we look back. Maybe even by next Sunday. What are we going to pray about this week? And what answers will we see the harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Let's pray. Lord, we simply rest in your presence. For we know we always can trust you. And we know that your compassion knows no bounds. And so we ask you to help us to share that compassion. We bring to you the community around about us in which we are set, the people we have to do with at home, at work, at school, in the shops, in the street, in social activities. And we lift to you each one, many people struggling because of physical ailments or mental anguish, or a sense of the unknown of life with no, no compass to steer them, no foundation on which to build, no shepherd to lead. Lord, we bring to you our community. We thank you, Lord, for those who are working to make a difference. We pray for the day center and for all those who benefit from its services. We pray for broke, not broken. And for all those who reach out with compassion to those in particular need. We pray for the work of Kaith in all that they do amongst the young people of our community. 
And we pray for the work of Ashley House amongst older members and those who are carers, medics, nurses. Lord, we ask a blessing on all those who serve the common good. We pray for our counsellors. We pray for our schools and their teachers and staff and pupils. We pray for social workers, for librarians, for shopkeepers. We pray for all who play their part in the smooth running of community life. And we ask, Lord God, that as we play our part, part of that may be the sharing of good news about a loving saviour, a good shepherd. Lord, today we pray for the family of Avril Kinloch and for all her friends and those who will miss her most in the days ahead. We ask that as we gather on Tuesday to give thanks for her life, all may know the comfort and peace that you've promised. We pray too, Lord, for Robert Calvert. And thank you for the measure of restoration you've given to him following his surgery. And we thank you for him returning to work very soon. We ask that you would sustain him and enable him to be a blessing in this community. And in the silence, Lord, we each bring to you the people, the places, the situations that are uppermost in our hearts and minds. In your great love and mercy, bring transformation, we pray, and fullness of life. For we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, as we draw near to the Lord's table, let's sing together in our communion hymn. Here, O my Lord, I see thee face to face.
This table is not the table of any one church. It is our Lord's table. And it is he who invites us, all who love the Lord and who seek to love him more, to share in the fellowship of this meal. We gather as a family of brothers and sisters in Christ in this place, young and old together. The Gospels tell us that on the first day of the week, Christ appeared to his disciples in the place where they were gathered and was made known to them in the breaking of bread. Come then to the Lord's table, to this joyful feast. Jesus welcomes all here. As we prepare ourselves, let us remember Jesus' words about not coming before God without first being reconciled to one another. And so let's take a moment to greet one another in the peace that Christ brings. We're mindful that some are still not comfortable about physical touch, but let's share the peace of Christ with one another. Peace be with you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us hear the record of the institution of the Lord's Supper as it is given to us by the Apostle Paul. I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, so we take these elements of bread and of wine to be set apart from their ordinary uses, to make this memorial, to proclaim Christ's death and to share in his victory. And as Jesus blessed God, so let us pray together. And we begin with the words, the ancient words that will appear on the screen. The Lord be with you. Lord lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right. It is our duty and our joy at all times and in all places to give you thanks and praise. Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God, for the majesty of your glory, the wonder of your works, the riches of your grace. Therefore, with your people of all places and times, and with the whole company of heaven, we proclaim your greatness and your praise in the angel's song. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. O Son in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. O Son in the highest. We are filled with thanks, Lord, that Jesus was born as one of us, that he has taught us your word and unleashed your great power in the world, 
But we're thankful most of all that he was willing to suffer and die for us on the cross, to carry our sin and to set us free. We praise you that he has won the victory over death itself and that he has returned to the glory of heaven to reign with you. We thank you that he keeps on speaking to you on our behalf and we thank you that he keeps on living in us by his Spirit. Holy Spirit of God, in union with the Father and the Son, we pray that you would come upon us all now to renew our faith, that this bread which we break may be for us by faith a sharing in the body of Christ, and that this cup of wine which we bless may be for us by faith a sharing in the saving blood of Christ, that we may know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly day by day. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We'll wait until all have been served, and then we'll share the one bread together. I invite the elders, please, to come and share the bread. Just hold on to your bread when you get it. Join with me in the words that will appear on the screen. Jesus, Lamb of God, Jesus, bearer of our sins, Jesus, redeemer of the world, we who are many are one body because we all share in the one loaf. Take and eat. The body of Christ was broken for you.
In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed with my blood. Drink from it, all of you. Again, we wait until all have been served and share the cup together. This is the cup of blessing. It is for us the cup of salvation. The blood of Christ was shed for you. Drink of this, all of you. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Glory be to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Lord, you have put gladness in our hearts, and you have filled us with good things. In your generosity towards us, you have even given us your only Son. How can we withhold anything from you? How can we hold back from sharing the good news of your coming with all around us? Renew us day by day with the gift of your Spirit, that we may give ourselves completely to your service and walk with joy in the footsteps of Jesus our Lord as we join our voices in the words that Jesus taught his first disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, and the Amen. Amen. And to ask that the cup be gathered in. you in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices holy and pleasing to God for this is your spiritual worship do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is his good pleasing and perfect will. 
So let's sing as we go. Father, I place into your hands the things that I can do. Amongst you and remain with you this day and always. <laughs> 